Yeah, so I'm going to be at the uh, ACE conference in Toronto. It's also the uh, world premiere of Unacknowledged uh, in Canada, and that's going to be uh, at the ACE conference at their host hotel. And, and you know, everyone is invited. Uh, there will be Saturday evening, and I'll have a, a Q&A, a question-answer period afterwards, and we hope people will uh, partake of that. And uh, then I'm uh, giving a presentation at the conference on Saturday and then Sunday doing a uh, all-afternoon workshop for people, which will be uh, – the focus is going to be how the intelligence community has infiltrated the UFO uh, subculture over the last 60 years uh, and what that means in terms of disinformation that has populated uh, the subject and what we can do about it and also what to look for. Uh, when when information comes out that begins to masquerade as disinformation. Uh, the other part of it is going to be how everybody who, who we, you know, we get thousands of emails say, what can we do to help? What can we do for disclosure? A big thing you can do is network this to other people, of course. Uh, and I think that's number the reason why we're still number one on iTunes after six weeks, which is unprecedented for a documentary. But I think we're really wanting to focus on that this is a shift in consciousness, that if people can become ambassadors to these civilizations in a large enough number, they're going to want to make contact with humans more and more openly. A lot of people say, why don't they just land on the White House lawn or you know do something like that? I say, well, the reason they don't is that they have a policy of nonviolence uh, and non-intervention. I know it sounds very Star Trek-y. But it, we humans have to reach out to these extraterrestrial civilizations in a way that shows them that we're ready for contact. And that's the Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind Initiative, is when humans go out using advanced concepts of meditation and a non-locality of consciousness to make contact with these civilizations and invite them to make contact with us. We just got back uh, about two weeks ago from uh, an expedition in Arizona that was amazing for the amount of contact we had. We literally had uh, extraterrestrial beings that appeared and disappeared in our circle. We had a craft that appeared the very first night, four lined up in a row, materialized and dematerialized. Uh, we have some amazing photos and images of that. So I'm going to go through some of the uh, CE5 type experiences we've had and teach people how to make contact and how to be an ambassador from humanity to these civilizations. And I can't talk about, but there's some things that are going to happen in a few months where around 100 million people will see it, 100 million. The goal is to have this become sort of the, the arrowhead, it's like those Chevron-shaped ships that fly over us. <laughs> we had over at Joshua Tree actually not long ago. And those are from the Arcturan star system, by the way, if you're curious. Uh, and these, this effort is really to, to push into the mass consciousness of the world because it takes a certain mass consciousness shift to make things happen. And I have always said for 20-some years, if the leaders, if the people will lead, the leaders will have to follow. But the people haven't been leading. We haven't been doing enough. And this is uh, where we need, I'm going to consider this, and... By the way, welcome to all the thousands of people watching. We need to go through something very advanced here because I consider you guys to be the vanguard in the disclosure effort, in the effort to make contact with these civilizations peacefully, and in fact to create a new civilization on Earth. And to do that, you've got to understand and have discernment between what's information and what's disinformation. And that discernment is very hard to come by because if you go to most conferences or go on the Internet, and unfortunately even on things like Gaia TV, you're going to get one part information, five parts disinformation. And the reason for that is that people are doing it deliberately, not the, necessarily the people being interviewed and given talks, but the people who are providing that information to those folks. So the very first thing we want to go through today is how counterintelligence works. But here's what I've found out about this, and it's been 27 years of a tutorial for me 
that I'm going to share with you. Uh, and it's not going to be a pretty story. Uh, it, it, some of this is going to be deeply disconcerting to people. It would be the opposite of what we're doing tomorrow night when we're doing contact out into the stars using uh, the, the mantras and sacred Vedic knowledge and higher consciousness and all of that. This is going to be a journey through uh, the national security state as it has devolved from a rather modest and small operation before World War II to the monster it has become today. And this monster, beginning in 1947, is, it was hatched in the cradle of Roswell. And the reason for it, the entire national security apparatus got transformed when they realized that they had finally shot one of these objects down. Now, I say shot, shot it down, what do I mean? There are electromagnetic weapons, Tesla-type coils, that were being worked on in the 20s, 30s, 40s that are scalar, longitudinal type weapons. Now, these are weapons that, if you understand what a wave of, of, of light is, it has a wave component and, of course, photon, the particle component. But it's a wave, and the speed of light is what? 186,000 miles per second. So every second, light goes 186,000 miles. A scalar, or longitudinal, wave, it's a point that is outside the wavelength of light, and it is actually propagated at multiples of the speed of light. Now, this has been studied for the better part of a century, but unfortunately has been weaponized and began to be weaponized. The FBI memo that you saw in the film Unacknowledged, if you study it, read it carefully, and then look at also other documents that we have, the electronic warfare systems were stood up between World War II and 1947, in those years of the, of the early, because they realized that there were these ET crafts zipping around our aircraft in World War II. You know what they were called? Foo Fighters. Yes, there is a band named Foo Fighters, and I'd say 99% of the kids I talk to go, well, that's a rock band. I said, yeah, but before that, it was what UFOs were called in World War II. And a member of my team, who was the original researcher on cattle mutilations, we'll get to this in a moment, uh, Dr. Altshuler, he was a very renowned hematologist, um, oncologist in Denver, Colorado. And his uncle was General Jimmy Doolittle. And General Do Doolittle was sent over to the European theater in World War II to look into Foo Fighters, because these things were zipping around our aircraft, going down the middle of them, materializing, dematerializing, doing all this stuff with our electronics. We didn't understand what this was. Now, initially, we thought, the Americans and the, the, the Allied forces thought that it was a German secret weapon. And, but the Germans, we found from intelligence, thought it was a secret Allied weapon. And so President Roosevelt sent General Doolittle over there and said, find out what these are. So he came back to the White House, and I know this because he, he directly told Dr. Altshuler this, his, his nephew, that they were, and, and reported back to FDR, sir, these are interplanetary vehicles. So at that point, it began to be understood that not only were these extraterrestrial, but they were transdimensional, we'll get into this in a moment, and that the technologies behind it are the really high end of electronic uh, vortices that are created that allow an object to go from one point in space to another, materialize, dematerialize, and, but also when it's in this dimension, has all kinds of effects on conventional electronics. Cars stop, magnetic compasses spin, et cetera, and so on. So this began to be looked at, and they figured out how to do some countermeasures. And countermeasures are figuring out how, th how to uh, adapt, and this was uh, going on before Roswell. Now, in 1947, the only nuclear bomb squadron in the world 
was in Roswell, New Mexico, the 508th Bomber Squadron. And no other bomber squadron in the world had atomic weapons on Earth. The Russians didn't have it yet, etc. So this particular system was in a radar dome. And in the FBI memo, it says they apparently switched on a new high-powered radar that interfered with the electronics of the navigation of these craft, and they collided. And it's true. We know that three ET craft crashed at Roswell, but the third one wasn't found until, I believe, 1951, early 50s. It went off and crashed in a very remote area. And the other two, one was blown to smithereens, and one proceeded westward near Socorro and had uh, in, crashed intact, and there was one living uh, extraterrestrial biological entity on it, and the others were ve ve very badly mangled and died. So that began the whole modern era where they had perfected a way of knocking down these extraterrestrial vehicles that were coming in and around our atomic weapons facilities. And it was no coincidence that that was also within months of when the Air Force split off from the Army Air Force. There was no U.S. Air Force until after Roswell, and when the CIA was formed. I'm going through this history, not to bore you, so that you have some context to understand that this is 70-some years in the making of covert black projects studying this issue. And the fact that the man on the street doesn't know this, so what? You need to know it, and I'm going to go into 10 times, 100 times more information, because I'm assuming you know what's in the film. If you didn't see the film, I'm sorry. Now, fast forward into 1950s, and you have a guy named Eisenhower, who's a famous general in World War II, and Eisenhower, uh, after Truman, authorized the continuation of the study of the modus operandi, I'm quoting from a top secret document from Canada, the Wilbur Smith document, on how these craft m operated. And so a very intense, unacknowledged special access project, this is when they really started, in the late 40s and 50s were stood up to acquire the technology and figure out how these things work. By October 1954, we had mastered gravity control, what pop culture would call anti-gravity, which means that everything that we're using on this planet since 1954 has been obsolete since that date. Now, how do I know that? Well, a man who was on my team for years until he passed away of prostate cancer a couple years ago Rick Foe, she was the uh, highest ranking scientist at the largest Department of Defense lab. And Mr. Foch, um was a very good friend, stayed at my home, knew his family very well, uh, was very direct in saying that he was in the vault and actually acquired uh, and saw a document that stated that they had mastered gravity control October 1954. Now, <laughs> this is before I was born and I have eight grandchildren. But what ended up happening is that the national security state did not want this out. A, they understood it could be weaponized, and they wanted to weaponize it, turn into weapons. And B, the energy source, as you heard from people in this film and, and in other testimony, is the zero-point energy field where you could have something that would basically fit on this little stand, and it could power as was said, a, flat, uh, a, a wristwatch or an entire city. You could, New York City could be powered off of that. Free energy. And that's not a myth either. But the same oligarchs and sociopaths and fascists who ran the world economy in the time of Tesla in the 20s and in the time of uh, T. Townsend Brown in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, who was doing experimentation with voltages and levitation with crystals. You know about those studies. And in the time of Eisenhower in the 50s, those fascists are still here. <laughs> we didn't defeat them. They just went subterranean. All right? 
So I often say we're really living in the Fourth Reich. And uh, I had an interesting conversation with uh, a man. It, this is Senator John Warner's son. All right. And Senator John Warner, I knew back in the 90s, was a member of the MAGIC Committee, Majority Intelligence Committee, M-A-J-I-C, that's been managing the secrecy on this for 70-some years, since Truman. And he says, you know, my, my grandfather, towards the end of his life, who was Paul Mellon, uh, one of the few billionaires on the planet back in those days, now they're a dime a dozen. And what happened is that Paul Mellon told him, prior to his death, that when World War II ended, they went over and they got from Adolf Hitler's scientists a disc, and there was also a bell, but his, his, his grandfather, Paul Mellon, re was there when they retrieved a flying disc. Now, it wasn't perfected yet, and that was Adolf Hitler's secret weapon, was an anti-gravity electronic disc. We had an atomic bomb. We got the atomic bomb before he got the flying disc. Understand? And therefore, they brought it back in. But he says, look, he says he knew that his family and all those people who went over there were fascists at heart. But prior to the war, they were overtly supportive of Adolf Hitler and fascism, as was the founder of IBM, as was Ford, as was a whole lot of fame, as Prescott Bush, uh, Elder Bush's dad. These were all sympathizers with fascism, which is just a matter of historical fact. It's not a political statement. It's a historical fact. Now, those folks didn't go away at the end of World War II. We de defeated the German army. We did not defeat the ideology and the authoritarianism of fascism. And that is what you need to understand to get your mind around what's been going on for the last 70 years. The pretense that we're living in a free world and a free democracy when in reality we're, li we're living in the second and third generation of the fascist state that existed during Adolf Hitler's time. Now, what happened when they had an almost perfected Nazi bell and disc and that research folded into the R&D and reverse engineering of an extraterrestrial vehicle? And they had one, and then they had another, and there were other downings. And I have one man on my team who will not come public because he's in fear of his life was at Fort Huachuca over here in Arizona at an underground facility. This is where Army Intelligence Headquarters is. And there were nine extraterrestrial crafts stored there, and he personally saw the different species and bodies. So and that was back in the 70s when he was there. So... This has been going on for 70 years, where we have been deliberately and purposely targeting and downing extraterrestrial craft who have come in moss from multiple civilizations from around the universe when we began detonating atomic weapons. Now, were many of these civilizations aware of Earth prior to that? Yes. Had many of them visited us? Yes. It's like ancient aliens TV show. Much of that is true. Um, in fact, there's a man who works under contract to, at IT&T, but he really works for the CIA. And whenever they find an ancient artifact that's technological, that's hundreds of thousands to several million years old, and they exist, uh, he will study it and, and tell the intelligence community, the IC for short, what that would be used for and how it operated. The guy is a genius. I mean, absolute genius. He's also stayed at my home. So the, what I've found with these sort of gentlemen is that they know a great deal, but they can speak of only so much. And so whatever you see in the Disclosure Project archives is less than 1% of what I've gotten briefed on. Um, and I'm going to try to give you the other 99% as much as I can. We're going we're gonna to take a, a tour de force through this information so that when you then hear other speakers or hear other information, you can begin to have a scintilla of discernment between is this real or is it Memorex? You understand? Is this, is this something that is man-made, masquerading as ET, or is it actually ET, or is it you don't have enough data to make the determination? What I call the gray area. Well, huh? no pun intended. And, uh, 
<laughs> yes, that's another whole discussion. Um, so when they began to study this from both human experimentation with electromagnetic systems, anti-gravity from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and then that combined and was greatly supplemented, augmented, augmentation was massive from studying the extraterrestrial materiel. That paid off by 1954. And by 1954, guess what? You know, it's like I was a kid born in 1955. I'll be 62 next month. And hard to believe. I was 34 when I started this project, and now I'm kind of an old dude. But what can you do? Uh, time goes on no matter what. We had this amazing uh, technological transfer that happened. Now, we had a chance at peace. And you all heard the rumors that Eisenhower had a meeting out here in the desert of California where Edwards Air Force Base is now, Muroc. That happened. And when I was in the process of putting together the briefing for the Minister of Defense and the President of France back in 07, 08, that period, about 10 years ago, they sent me a report from someone that they had in their archives who had been there with Eisenhower. And what the extraterrestrial civilizations were asking for, and yes, they do work together, uh, they have different specialized functions. We'll get into that depending on their natural capabilities and interests, uh, like all peoples. But they offered to help our civilization technologically if we would stop this proliferation of hydrogen bombs, thermonuclear weapons. Eisenhower was friendly to this. Uh, Others, like Forrestal, were. He got killed. George Patton, by the way, the General Patton, was very supportive of disclosing these uh, technologies to the public after they retrieved them from the Nazis in 1945, and he was assassinated because of that. He was killed because of his support for disclosure. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, so this is how... <laughs> This is, we, we went completely off the rails between 1947 and 1955. And we haven't gotten it back in place since. So we're, we're, we're now 60 some years into an unconstitutional, deep government. This is not a conspiracy theory. This is an absolute fact, and we can prove it. That does not answer to the constitutional authorities, whether it's the president or the Congress, or even some of their generals and admirals that I have briefed. So these unacknowledged special access projects became more and more and more powerful as they got more and more technology and money and started taking a bigger and bigger and bigger piece of the U.S. budget, but also spun off corporations that then spun off things like integrated circuits and computers and fiber optics and night vision these all came from studying extraterrestrial materiel items and were highly profitable. Now, never mind that you and me, the taxpayers, paid for all the research and development, and these corporate Nazis, who are psychopaths, took it, monetized it, and it made trillions of dollars. And we're happy to use our iPhone, and we're just clucking along, and ignorant of the fact that this is all stolen technology from we, the people. So, you know, that is what began to happen, and this is why Eisenhower said, beware the military-industrial complex. And one of the most important, uh, I don't know how if we have some of these clips lined up, but I want to go through just real quickly, because it, it kind of does it in a, in a compact way, the, uh, some clips. And our first one is this one from Eisenhower, and this is what he's talking about. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. Next. Many a shadowy government with its own Air Force, its own Navy, its own fundraising mechanism, 
and the ability to pursue his own ideas of the national interest, free from all checks and balances, and free from the law itself. This is a senior senator from Hawaii, Inouye, talking about the deep national security state on the Senate floor during the Iran-Contra, but he's referring, he has his own funding mechanism, et cetera, and so on. Think about that. It's self-funded. No one is overseeing it. The senators aren't. You aren't. And most certainly the President of the United States isn't. Next. The nations of the world will have to unite, for the next war will be an interplanetary war. The nations of the Earth must someday make a common front against attack by people from other planets. General Douglas MacArthur. Look at the date on that. Okay, the date on that, I was four months old, October 1955, precisely one year after we mastered gravity control. So the warmongers and the war profiteers and the psychopaths who love endless war hatched a plan in the early and mid-50s. And one of the documents we have from Walter Bedell Smith, the CIA director from 1953, talks about the psychological warfare value of the UFO subject. We'll get into that in a moment. Next clip. It is time for the truth to be brought out. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about the UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, Many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. I urge immediate congressional action to reduce the dangers from secrecy about unidentified flying objects. CIA Director, Vice Admiral, Roscoe Hillenkeeter. Pause it. That was the first director the CIA formed after Roswell. That gentleman in 19, you saw the date, wrote to the Congress and it was published in the New York Times. Around the same time, Eisenhower warned of the military-industrial complex. And this is a five-star general, you know, and this was an admiral. I mean, these are not, you know, it's not Abby Hoffman saying these things, all right, from the 60s or some hippie. These are your key military people warning you. And why he said that at the end, he didn't say the UFOs were a threat to the national security. He said the secrecy is a threat to the national security, just as Eisenhower did. And every single admiral, flag officer, general I have met with, and director of intelligence entities, from the CIA to the DIA to the alphabet soup of things here and abroad, have said, yes, this secrecy is a threat to world security and peace, because they have so much power and technology, and no one in the system outside these unacknowledged criminal enterprises that are running the secrecy have any control over it. Next clip. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. All right, pause it. Here we go. Now let me tell you how this came about. One of the men who developed SDI, Star Wars, the Strategic Defense Initiative in its early conceptual days, uh, it was a colonel, Holman, and he and I talked about this a great deal. And he was on a briefing team that would go in and try to scare the hell out of the U.S. president about the ETs. So some of the presidents have been briefed just enough to secure their cooperation on a, what MacArthur called an interplanetary war, where they want to create a scenario in the future where instead of us fighting you know, a few hundred terrorists in the Middle East, or a few thousand even, and spending a trillion dollars a year on intelligence and defense spending, we can stampede the entire planet into hysteria using psychological warfare and host alien events to have an interplanetary conflict that would enrich the warmongers a thousand times more than the Iraq War did, which was also a fake war, right? There were no weapons of mass destruction there, but it, we killed hundreds of thousands of people marching in there. And Colin Powell was deceived. And if you think people aren't being deceived, think about this. Secretary of State Colin Powell was sent up there by Cheney and his henchmen 
to tell people as a matter of certainty and fact that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction, which he did not have. And Colin Powell had been the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and a four-star general. And he was deceived by these devils in the intelligence community. And it led to a disastrous situation that is getting worse with, of course, now we have ISIS. Because you go in there, we broke it up. This was all by design, so that we keep the fire burning. It's like that rock song. Keep the fire burning, because how do you justify trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars going into these same war profiteers and warmongers unless you have an enemy? But we're running out of substantially large enough enemies to feed the monster and the beast. So the big one is coming. Let's continue. When Von Braun was dying in front of me the very first day that I met him, he had tubes draining out of his side. And he was tapping on the desk telling me, you will come to Fairchild. I was a school teacher. You will come to Fairchild and you will be responsible for keeping weapons out of space. The strategy that Werner von Braun taught me was that first the Russians were the enemy against whom we're going to build space-based weapons. Then terrorists would be identified. Then we were going to identify third world country crazies. And the next enemy was asteroids. The last card is the alien card. And all of it, he said, is a lie. A lie. <laughs> Love her. Here's the truth that people don't want to hear. Now, she didn't know this. Carol didn't know this. By the 1950s and 60s, because we had man-made UFOs, they were able to do things that looked alien and to 99.9999999% of the population would be, including the president, but were actually being done by the intelligence community and these unacknowledged special access projects, USAP, super secret projects. And these include, but are not limited to, the following. UFO events, UFO crashes, we'll get to this in a moment, the abduction of humans with people and then entities that were man-made, that look alien, and the use of electronic warfare systems to simulate those experiences, as well as certain chemical weapons uh, and hallucinogens. Now, how many people heard of MK Ultra, the 50s, 60s, you know, giving acid to people? What they didn't tell you during the Senator Church's hearing is that the crown jewel of the mind control projects of the 1950s and 60s and 70s was not chemical or LSD or hallucinogens. It was electronics. So here's something that I'm going to tell you that I learned in 1993 or 4 by the man who invented it. A man who invented an electronic system that interfaced directly with consciousness. It was used both actively and passively. In other words, you could put this on and it would enable the person no matter how skilled or unskilled, to remote view with consciousness at a different point in space or time. This was 1956. 56. But it can also be used to give people experiences which are completely hallucinogenic, but which come across as incredibly real. He said to me, and I later had this confirmed by many different scientists who work for E-Systems and Raytheon and a whole you know, pl plethora of, of uh, intelligence community contractors, so that they could give you an experience. It'd be like uh, virtual reality but on steroids, where you would have the ability to have uh, someone have this experience, and it is so real because it's in consciousness that it's being done. It's in their mind. And it can be done remotely and targeted remotely. And those people, and this is what this gentleman, and I'm quoting, he says, if we want you to have a personal conversation with your personal God, 
Jesus, Buddha, Krishna, whoever, you'll have it, you'll pass a lie detector test that it's real. It is that good. Now, fast forward to a few years ago, I'm on one of these expeditions, we lead out under the stars, and a woman comes who used to work for one of these companies, and he, she said yes, and we could sit in a room with a console, turn a dial, target the board of directors of a corporation, and if we wanted them to come agreement on something we wanted them to come to agreement on, we could turn the dial and there would be complete harmony. We can turn the dial the other way and they'd all be fighting. It's absolutely. I said, when were you working that project? She said, in the mid-70s. This is what Werner von Braun, it's not in this clip, warned about more than even the risk of interplanetary war, which psychopaths... And the people who tried to stop it, George S. Patton, killed. Forrestal, murdered. JFK, dead. Marilyn Monroe was going to just blow the whistle because she didn't know what she was stepping into. Whacked. So, you know, if you don't go along with the agenda, it's very dangerous, no matter who you are. Bill Colby, the CIA director for Ford, President Ford, trying to help us bring out free energy. The week he's going to meet with the, my, a member of my board of directors, they find him floating down the Potomac River, killed. Although his family thinks he either had an accident or was a suicide. It was neither. His best friend, a colonel, retired colonel, told me specifically that Bill Colby was assassinated because he was going off the reservation of the secrecy and trying to move disclosure forward, but most importantly, bring the technology out before both polar ice caps melt. And 70% of the population is underwater. And that's coming if we're not careful. So that is the kind of thing that... Now, this is what I deal with day in and day out. Now, the interstellar civilizations know we're in an emergency, too. The big red flag that went over Earth when we had detonated atomic weapons said, wow, these folks have so much beauty and promise, but there's an aspect of them that's gone so out of control that now they have technologies that could destroy all life on Earth and could become an existential threat to other planets because we're starting to go into space. This began the modern UFO era. So I always tell people, all these people running around afraid of the aliens and this intelligence guy and military guy who went to Ronald Reagan said, and he told me it was a hoax. He said, yes, there, you're right. There, there are ETs out there. They're a threat to us, and we need to put weapons in space, and we need SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And that is what brainwashed Reagan into making that comment at the United Nations and then brainwashed him into billions and billions and billions of dollars into uh, brilliant pebbles and all kinds of other stuff that's just nonsense. It never worked. So that they could take that money, use 10% of it on the stated project, like Brilliant Pebbles, and put the other 90% into black projects, weaponizing space. That's how it works. That's how the defense industry works. Um, and so he was played like a fiddle, sort of the Independence Day scenario. You know, the movie Independence Day with Will Smith, let's go kick alien butt! Ha, ha, ha! You know, all that jingoism and bullshit. And here's why it's nonsense. Because if you are an interstellar civilization and you wanted to just take care of the Earth problem, it'd take you one nanosecond. It's point, set, match, over. Now, we're going to go through in a little while what transdimensional interstellar technologies are. So you have a little understanding of why these scenarios that are being presented about this, this race and that race are out there, and it's the movie Star Wars. Well, this is great for Hollywood and George Lucas. And it sells billions of dollars worth of movies and seminars and space on Gaia TV. However, it is absolutely dangerous. And here it's why it's dangerous. Because when we start going down that path of a narrative of hate, what I call alienism. What's alienism? It's like racism, but you're, it's humans against another species instead of black against white. 
or Shia against Sunni, or one ethnic tribe against another, or one economic system against another. This is the big one that they want to play because the demagogues who are counting on endless war need your cooperation and need to have you brainwashed that there's an enemy that you should be afraid of and hate to support the next big war. And that's just a fact. Next clip. Air Force. Producers and directors. Yeah. And were they, how were they paid so that it wasn't? Cash. Yeah. You pay. What you do is you make them sign a form and you tell them, you got to report this to the IRS. But whether they do it or not, you, you know, you're, you're not going to give your form to IRS. I paid, I paid, uh, I better not say. There were, some of them are large. This is buying off the media. The same thing happens with... We did do that, yes. Uh, OSI did that. There was a special group uh, out of uh, the 7602nd Air Intel Wing at Fort Belvoir. They came out and did that. They uh, had these uh, people that had maybe some sort of defects, uh, antinomical defects that were uh, brought, brought in to... To, to fool people and thinking they're aliens. Yeah. Um, I can't give you any specifics because it's still, the program is still classified and they probably still doing it. I wouldn't doubt, doubt it. They were still doing it. Bang. Now, this guy was a professional disinformation counterintelligence officer. I did a three hour interview with him. It's in the movie Unacknowledged. He comes clean because I knew what to ask. So I asked him about the false flag. And I asked him about the intelligence community and military being involved in abductions, and he confirms it. But he also says, listen carefully, I can't go into that too much. That's still probably still going on, and it is. It absolutely is. Now, does this mean that everyone who's had contact with an ET has been done? No, it doesn't. It means that they want it to be so confused that you can't discern which is real contact and which is man-made. And the man-made ones are designed to be terrifying. Now, I want to go back to Dr. Altshuler, who was the only real solid scientist doing work on mutilations, cattle, horse. He did the Snippy the Horse case back in the 67 or whenever it was in Colorado. And he concluded that these were all being done by paramilitary humans made to look like UFOs. Now, when that was how it went on, we already had man-made UFOs going around doing stuff. They were testing out systems. And people say, oh, well, the cut was so precise, it couldn't have been done without, you know, some alien technology. Well, it wouldn't have been done with technologies that were in your local hospital in 1960 or 70 or 80. But in a classified project, they have it. You think that classified projects don't have things reaching parity with what ETs have? They have. So those events started happening, and I, by chance, when I was learning this from Dr. Altshuler, and he says, oh, yeah, he says, it's really too bad because my work has been taken by people who have been, are then saying, you know, all of this is being done by aliens, and this book, you know, an, al uh, you know, an alien harvest and this and that. And he said, no, we knew, all of us knew, that those were paramilitary operations, not E.T., Again, for their psychological warfare value. And they were getting raw materials they were using in their underground bases for biological experiments I'll get into in a moment if you really want to hear some Frankenstein stuff. These technologies have been very well developed and were operational when I was a child. Now, when you have an Air Force intelligence guy admit this, and also you have people coming forward like Ben Rich, who is the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works. In the film Unacknowledged, we have in his handwriting and a letter between he and a close friend, and he affirms that, yes, there are man-made UFOs and there are ET ones. This is the head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, the super-secret Skunk Works. And the Cube, which is the state-of-the-art facility underground near Edwards, where these operations are ongoing, I know a engineers worked there, 
these technologies are so beyond what you can imagine, anything you can imagine in a Star Trek movie or science fiction, they've already done in these, in these laboratories. So we have to begin to understand the extent to which there's the technology that you read about on CNN and in you know, tech journals and it comes out of Google or iPhones and what have you, and then there's the real high-tech stuff that is in the unacknowledged world. And you have to understand those technologies to understand what people call the alien phenomenon because 90% of it is man-made, masquerading as ET because they want people to have a new enemy to hate. So that begins to elucidate some other key points. Let's listen to Michael Stratt, who's a great researcher on covert military aircraft. Into the minds of people to expect an extraterrestrial, not a secret aircraft, but an alien craft. So when they do pull this, they'll already have everything ready to roll. Uh, these civilians got onto the base uh, and, and got into something, and they, they, uh, they saw something they weren't supposed to see, and this group came out and went into their home and scared the dickens out of them. And staged an alien yeah, event. Exactly. I, I said staged an alien event. He said exactly. That's happened thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Now, you can, if you weren't discerning and didn't have this, in, now this has taken me 27 years to find these sources and methods and do this research. You ignore it at your peril. You will ignore this information at your peril because you will be deceived again. Remember the Who song, we won't, be deceived, we won't be fooled again? We have been. Vietnam, Gulf of Tonkin. Iraq War, bang. This is the big one coming. Now, when Verna Von Braun was dying, that's why he wanted Carol Rosen to, to warn the planet that this was all going to be hoaxed. But it was hatched in the 50s, and the technological foundation for it was hacked in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, electronically and with anti-grabs. Now, is this to say that nothing going on out there or any events that people have with beings are real ET? No, there are a lot of real ET events. But you, if you don't know the distinction between one and the other, you're going to slam them all together. And the best disinformation is coded in information that's true, and at the of it is that poison pill. And what I would suggest to you, and the reason I made this film, is that if I got a heads up that that agenda was being fast-tracked in the last year or two. And I think this is the biggest thing that people miss, and that is for 70 years, the intelligence community has had a running start on everyone putting out false information, and they're still doing it. And so if you're going to be an ambassador of these civilizations, you have to do it in a way that you're fully informed. And that's what this four-hour webinar and uh, uh, workshop is going to be about. So if you can't be in Toronto uh, that weekend, I hope you can join us by webinar. And it's going to be a, a very intensive a journey through uh, this entire subject uh, from the 40s till now and how the intelligence community has uh, infiltrated it, but also how we can overcome that disinformation and counterintelligence operation by becoming ambassadors to these civilizations and groups all over the world. There are now tens of thousands of people doing this, by the way. And I think that when it reaches a critical mass in the hundreds of thousands or millions, that's going to signal to the ETs that humans are ready for open contact. Um, with both the film Serious and Unacknowledged, We've actually never had a premiere where afterwards um, there was an opportunity to do a uh, question and answers with the audience. So uh, we're going to do that in Toronto. People have asked for it. So on Saturday night, uh, stay tuned, and uh, either by a webinar for the Q&A or if you're there in person. And then the uh, workshop, I hope people will understand that if you, if you become – an ambassador of these civilizations, what they're looking for are people who are free of prejudice and are open-minded and are willing to make contact with them for peaceful purposes, 
which is the mission we have. Our motto is one universe, one people.